Welcome to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. We got a great show for you this week. Just a couple of highlights. Siemens Gamesa is debuting their SG14-222DD offshore wind turbine. Uh, mechanical engineer in Germany is talking about building 250 meter tall wind energy towers. Interesting. And we'll look at some of the, the latest gyrations in the United States in terms of untapped wind energy. And the Biden administration hooking up with 11 East Coast states to push offshore wind supply chains and ships. So there's a lot on our docket this week. It's going to be a great show. Stay tuned. So guys, Siemens Gamesa and their SG14-222DD wind turbines are getting some orders. And that's good, right? Siemens Gamesa needed some orders here on those offshore projects. So they had a firm order for 60 turbines off the coast of Scotland. And they are the B108 blades. So I was thinking, the B108 blades is not even the latest generation of blades off from Siemens Gamesa. The latest generation is the B115, so it's even longer. Um, but the, the first deployment is going to be in 2024, and I know they were already generating their, from their prototype uh, back in 2021. They were generating electricity in 2021 with that same tournament. So it's taking like three years, two and a half years between prototype to actual first installs. Rosemary, does that seem right? Is there is there a two to three year time lag between prototype and first installations or is this a sales COVID issue uh yeah it's not normal um maybe if you know it was i don't know some massive massive design change then that might happen but that would mean like maybe they've gone from a, a three blade rotor to a two blade rotor or <laughs> you, you know an upwind <laughs> to a downwind or you know something major you would take years but normally it's six months to one year um yeah so oh it's a bit surprising yeah Okay, so so, how long does that prototype sit in development then? How long do they sit it on its on the test site and spin it before they say thumbs up and off we go to production? So hold on, is it a whole new turbine or it's a? Um... It it is roughly yeah, it's fourteen megawatts. So sure. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, in that in that case, then um, forget what I said. I thought we were just talking about a, a different blade on a <laughs> on an existing platform. Um, in that case, yeah, then they're going to want a season of, of um, validation data. So, yeah, but it still seems like two two years after installing a, a prototype to start production seems lengthy. Seems like there, a... there must be something. Agreed. Yeah, so, like some new design feature that they need to, you know, properly test out before they really get started with the you know, locking it into their manufacturing process. There must be some sort of uncertainty that they're, they're worried about. Or it could be supply chain, like you say, but yeah, that'd be, hmm. yeah, something. <laughs> well, so that as these wind turbines get taller and taller, we're, we're seeing more ideas about raising the towers, making the towers taller. And as we go taller, I think, as Rosemary, you've had explained, the higher you go, the more consistent the winds, the, the more velocity in the wind and there's less is there more less variation from day to night there's more nighttime winds oh i don't know about the last point and i mean we're talking onshore or offshore because the, the problem is yeah offshore it's not so pronounced but onshore there's this concept called wind shear where you know th things on the ground slow the wind down so you know trees buildings hills um anything like that it causes friction with the you, you know, with the earth surface and it keeps the, the sure. air kind of attached, it's like a boundary layer. Um, and then as you go up and away from all those obstacles, the wind speed rises for a, a few hundred meters. Um, yeah, so basically the taller that you can go, the faster your, your wind speeds. Um, and other than that, there's local variations as well. In some places, there probably would be more consistent winds at that wind speed, uh, at that height, sorry. Um, but I don't think that that's like a generalized phenomenon. 
And then because the power in um, in the wind varies with the speed of the cube of the wind speed, that means that, you know, if you increase wind speed, if you, if you can double your wind speed, which you definitely can by, you know, raising above that, you know, that um, boundary layer. So you double the wind speed, you get eight times as much power. So you can see that it's it's really worthwhile to go after good wind speed sites. Oh, sure. Uh, and Joel, the gentleman who is designing this is a mechanical engineer based in Germany. His name is Horst Bendix. And he, he's, his concept is a lattice tubular structure, kind of pyramidal in shape, uh, to create this tower. It looks very similar to things you would see in oil and gas. Isn't that sort of how they do it in oil and gas? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot uh, easier to manufacture something that way as well, right? It's just pieces. You can put piece, smaller pieces together, build them up, um, and it's a bit quicker. Um, I think, because you can build them all, a lot of pieces off site, bring them in and throw them up. Um, but it looks, I mean, you've seen this structure before, right? This, it's fairly, fairly common, the lattice one that he's building, but 250 meters is, yeah, but, a, is a hell of a tall tower. That's really tall, right? But it's basically the same yeah. concept though, is that you, you build these sort of stackable layers and it does, I would assume it takes less material, so probably your cost for the tower would go down, especially if you're going to 250 meters. So uh, Mr. Bendix says, hey, let's build out a standard steel tubes, lowers the cost. And uh, Rosemary, kind of getting back to your discussion, says that uh, wind turbines be able to deliver 10 times the power of today's best facilities, and it would require roughly 80% less land to do the same thing. So it, basically by getting... 250 meters up in the air, you're going to have some really massive blades. And then the other concept, and Joel, I don't know if oil and gas does this, but basically uh, he's talking about taking the generator and putting it at the base and running some sort of chain, gear, spline, something, drive shaft, <laughs> from 250 yeah. meters from top to bottom. I mean, does that, does that make a, any sense? A 250 meter drive shaft would be pretty difficult to balance, I would think. <laughs> So maybe maybe something driven by chain or, or something of that of the other sort or you know a belt I don't know that'd be a long belt too, um, but yeah. you're gonna have there, there's I think that's the biggest engineering challenge of this whole thing like the lattice can be done, um, yeah. the blades can be done uh, that they'll be a little bit harder to work on be a little bit tougher to get people to go and hang off of those on a ropes to to fix them, uh, <laughs> at you know 800 feet up in the air but. Um, I think that that definitely how you're going to transfer the power down to the ground without power losses as well. You know, any kind of right. transmission or any other rotating weight, you're also going to uh, have some power suck there or some some energy suck. So uh, that's going to be the biggest the biggest trouble, I think. It's Not an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea to go back to the the lattice tower because that that was like you said, Joel. That was all that people did for a long time. And um, they definitively moved away from it once steel processing um, technology got to the point where you could make these rolled tubular towers. And yes, you do use less steel in a lattice tower, but the cost is, is a lot more. Um, and especially it really increases the construction time for the, the wind farm. So, you, you know, like it's really nice to move your labor into a, a factory where people are doing the same thing every day and get really good at it. When you have a lot of labor on site, it's like you have a different crew each time, usually or slightly different conditions and it just takes ages. So, I mean, it was definitely cost that caused us to go from lattice to tubular towers. So I'd be suspicious of somebody coming from outside the industry that thinks that there's a massive cost reduction to be made by going the other way. And then the other thing is that um, those towers weren't great for for birds <laughs> because birds would roost in them and then they would take off like just directly into the blades. So that was one of the reasons <laughs> why wind turbines have a, a bad reputation for birds, which is for the most part untrue these days. But back in the day, it was certainly <laughs> certainly true that those um, those structures were not bird friendly in all cases. I wouldn't even consider that. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like a very odd design parameter. Can't have pigeons <laughs> taking roosts a hundred meters off the ground. I don't think anybody cares ground. about that. Not many people probably care about the pigeons, but you know, if you've got an endangered bird that's that's roosting there, then people then people care. So we've been looking at untapped wind energy potential, and there's been a couple of websites that are, that have described what the sort of the maximum amount of wind you could get in in each of the forty eight contiguous states in the United States. 
And it's it's a little shocking because you wouldn't figure some of these states have that much potential for wind energy. Texas being the largest, obviously, it's a huge state and there's a lot of wind there. And so they're, they're capable of 1,300 gigawatts. That's a lot. And right now they only have 33 gigawatts installed. So they're like <clears throat> one twentieth, one quarter of the way of of what they could do to max out. And let me give you the the first couple in order in terms of the wind potential. Texas, then Montana, New Mexico, Kansas, which is a big wind state, Arizona, which is not a big wind state, Wyoming, Nevada, Nebraska, another big wind state, South Dakota, big wind state, Colorado, and Oklahoma, those two are big wind states. So some of the some of the top Twelve are actually states that really have very little in terms of wind, which is unusual because you think something Joel like some place like Arizona, which is not that yeah. far from California, could be part of that feed-in network that to keep grid, California yeah. lights on. Right? They need it. Right? Isn't that, they need uh, it. It's it's just a little backwards. Some of the the smallest ones are, are places you would expect. Pretty much anywhere on the east coast, northeast of the United States. Pennsylvania, New York, Virginia, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maryland, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, Rhode Island. Those are just small states, but they, they don't have any potential to speak of in terms of wind, and they don't have much wind installed even. Uh, so if all the energy and all the wind energy is in the middle of the United States and there's very little on the edges besides offshore, isn't the key to, <laughs> to wind energy is to get the wind where it's strong to the places where it's weak with via transmission lines to get the electricity to the to the coast coastal regions Joel am I missing yeah, I something here it just seems like that's part of the answer no we keep coming back to the same conversation right like there's you have to get your resources to where they're they're needed it's as yeah. simple as that right so we have we have power in the a lot in the middle part of the country we need to get it to the outsides the odd thing here is like Arizona. Uh, being a right. you know like the fifth or sixth most cap- like possible capacity, having basically none. That's, that that's that one blew my mind looking at some of this data. Um, and the only thing I could think of is like people not want to install wind there because of like erosion or I don't know in the desert. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm Solar not sure. Instead, but there's yeah, there's some there's some reason, and I guess that one's beyond me um, in this chart. But yeah, I mean it boils down to the same thing and. Texas has done a great job of they've got 33 capacity or 33 gigawatts of capacity installed. That's because of the transmission lines, right? All that stuff is in yes. West Texas, but that that's feeding directly back to Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, you know, down to Houston um, along the I-10 right. corridor and whatnot. And now the cool thing in Texas that people are starting to do, um, there's a lot of solar going in there as well. But they're starting to you're starting to see like application for solar permit, application for solar permit, and then if you look at them, they're yep. all within a couple miles of transmission lines. The whole way out oh, to yeah. West Texas, um, so it's it's smart development um, that you're starting to see uh, on the Texas side. Of course, I guess the interesting thing for me is if you look at the armchair math: thirteen hundred and fifty gigawatts of capacity in Texas, thirty three yeah. gigawatts installed, and it's feeding twenty percent of the electrical grid. So the armchair math tells me <laughs> that wind capacity in Texas is eight hundred percent of demand. If it was all installed, could be yeah. Of Texas's Crazy, demand, right? That's yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of Texas's it's demand, a, right? Of this, of right. the state, right? Maybe this um, is how Texas will get connected so, and, to, and, <laughs> to the other other grids because they have got an export yeah, opportunity. Yeah. And I mean, it's not like it, Australia has yeah. a similar. If you do the maps for Australia, we have similarly just way, way, way more wind and solar capacity than we can use. And so people are thinking of ways to export it, but it's hard for us because we're we're an island continent. You know, you've got to build three thousand kilometer subsea yeah, cables, or we've got to, you know, <laughs> figure out how to ship hydrogen or ammonia. Um, whereas Texas has the <laughs> the technology right there, they just are resistant <laughs> resistant to connecting Stop. up. But yeah, yeah, they're maybe just stubborn. They're, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the stop being yeah, stubborn. The financial opportunity <laughs> will be what, what convinces them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's Arizona, true. Nebraska, I, Iowa is it's not on this list, but because it's not one of the strongest produce producers, but it is a large producer right now. So they're taking. I think they print, create like fifty percent or a little bit more of their electricity yeah. from wind right now. That's crazy. Yeah, so the they, they could easily. Right, so they could easily feed a Chicago, a Detroit, an Indianapolis. Uh, that would be simple for them to do. They could be an energy exporter, which I think is where they're headed. 
right now, which, which makes yeah. sense, right? It, you could be the the uh, Texas of wind power, but <laughs> Texas it, Texas is the wind power king. Iowa will always come in second place if if that's going to happen. Get the latest on wind industry news, business, and technology sent straight to you every week. Sign up for the Uptime Tech Newsletter at weatherguardwind.com slash news. This leads to what's happening offshore in the United States. So on the Northeast Corridor, which is like New York, Virginia uh, area, uh, the, the White House has been working with 11 East Coast states, uh, this happened last week, to develop a partnership. And the, the initiative is to drive the domestic uh, manufacturing sites and get all the supply chain set up to feed this 30 gigawatts by 2030, including ships and, and all the offshore pieces. So there's a lot to this, right? Uh, but they really haven't had a, a large initiative between the states and the federal government to get it going. Well, that seems to be changing. And... Already, it's run into a little bit of turmoil because there are no ships to to do the the work that are based that are built in the United States. So they're talking about at least Congress is talking about saying, okay, we could use outside ships. You could use ships from Australia, but to either be it must be uh, manned by Australians or Americans. You can't load the Australian ship up full of Englishmen or, or whatever they're going to do. So the offshore wind companies are like, whoa, 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 that's not okay. And those kind of restrictions are going to make it very difficult for us to complete projects. In fact, they got a letter from a, a large group of two dozen offshore wind companies and trade groups that said, there are 19 projects offshore that won't happen if you do that. So the, the offshore wind companies, operators, want there to be uh, – probably cruise from Denmark, it'd be my guess, <laughs> that they'll come over and with the ships and the people to come do the work. Joel, is, isn't that where they're going? That's one that we're talking about, really. Well, I mean, as it sits right now, you could do that legally, but you would have to you would have to come across from Denmark and never make port. The, never all touch the, pieces, the port, right. All the pieces, components, everything would have to be shipped out to you, fuel, food, whatever. You could do it, right. you could do ship to ship transfers, and then you got to go back. So there's companies that are starting to, you know, I mean, of course, this the Jones Act has been a hallmark of maritime in the U.S. for a long time, um, to, controlling a lot of the oil and gas world around in the Gulf and whatnot. Right. But there's companies that have played in that space for a long time. They're starting to make moves. I just saw the other day, um, if, if you're in the U.S. and you've been around maritime at all, you've heard of Crowley. Crowley yeah. is one of the biggest logistics and transportation companies uh, that we have. Um, I think they are the biggest, actually, if you were to put everything together, ships, trains, all the above. But they just signed a joint venture with ESVAC. Um, and the and the idea is take the ESVAC knowledge. Of, ESVAC has some of the most capable SOVs in the North Sea that have been working in um, SOVs of service operation vessels that have been working in offshore wind for years and years and years and years. So they have a very good design, a very good operational uh, policies and how they operate those ships and how they're built. So now they're going to bring that same design, come over here, build it in the U.S. and have Jones Act compliance SOVs. Um, but, you know, you don't build a ship in the same speed you build a doghouse in. So it's going to take a little while right. to build those. But at least they're starting to make moves, right? Well, the, the question is, can that really functionally work if you did bring crews from some other part of the world let's say denmark in this case mm -hmm. it gets really complicated right so you, you all the little ships would have to feed this danish ship with sandwiches and coffee and fuel and all the wind turbine components that's a big rye deal it's, don't forget a, rye bread <laughs> rye, rye bread right. staple yes yeah <laughs> be trouble if you didn't have that yeah. yes it just seems like it adds a layer, layer of of complication on onto an already yeah. complicated thing. And so now uh, the Department of Energy has been tasked to sort of manage this state federal consortium bit. And if you start looking at the numbers and I got, I started a deep dive, Rosemary, on all these wind numbers for the United States. I, I, I pulled a Rosemary is what happened, you know, Rosemary gets, she knows so much detail what's going on. Like, okay, you can really get sucked into this black hole of, of, technical information. But if you look at the, the amount of wind capacity added in the United States over the last couple of years, in 2020, we had 17 gigawatts. In 2021, it went down to 13 gigawatts added. 
capacity. In 2022, it's going to be 11. In 2023, it's going to be five. All right, so it's dropped by 60% over the last couple of years. And the, the pace is slowing down is because the production tax credit, the production tax credit, which is sort of the basis for all wind energy in America, for the most part, drives that industry. And that's going away at the end of this year, 2022. So that has a cascading effect. We, Joel and I were talking earlier about the number of wind blade sites in the United States, and we think there are two. One in North Dakota for LM, and Vestas has one in Colorado. Now, we're not sure how busy the one in Colorado is, but Siemens Camesa has closed two facilities in the last year, uh, Iowa and in Kansas. Vestas consolidated two factories into one in 2021. LM closed its Little Rock, Arkansas plant in 2020 and has the plant up in North Dakota. So LM has a plant in North Dakota. And then TPI, which was a fairly large blade manufacturer and had a place in Rhode Island and a place in Iowa, uh, the place in Iowa closed down, and the place in Rhode Island is making, like, automotive pieces or train something or another. They're out of the wind business altogether. So we've gone from having a lot of wind blade capacity to very little. And Siemens Gamesa is still talking about building that factory in Virginia, but I don't think that's even started yet. Offshore. So the DOE yeah. is – yeah, that's just straight offshore, right? So the, mm -hmm. the DOE is, is going to lead this comprehensive effort for offshore wind, and they're expecting to throw – $12 billion at it annually to set up up to 10 manufacturing plants and uh, the ships necessary to deploy this stuff. Now, the question is, <laughs> so they're gonna, they're, they're, there's one more piece of this. And at the end of this year, they're going to come up with a plan to do all this work. So we're at the end of 2022, and now we have the plan. And then we're going to try to deploy 30 gigs in by 2030, we're going to run out of time and we don't have any, the United States doesn't have a lot of built in infrastructure. How does this all happen? And even if they throw 12 billion out of a year, and I think that's helpful, does that really get the wind industry started or does the onshore business really collapse? Cause that's where it's headed to right now. And just everything move offshore. Is that the future? Does it, did, the, did they come around and say the 12 billion is loans or, Grants. Investment. They call it investment, which I think Just are investment. grants. I, yeah. It could be loans. Okay. So I could see grants really starting to kickstart that. And what I'd like to see is those be whatever facilities are built for the offshore wind industry are dual purpose. That's what I'd like to see. You'd think, right. Let, yeah. Let, let's, if we're going to invest this kind of money, let's bring it to the, uh, the industry as a whole and not sequester it to one little thing because we because we road stamped 30 gigawatts of offshore wind, which is great, but there's a lot of other things that could be done as well. Um, right. So this this money coming in could could very well help. I know like we need quayside facilities. We need manufacturing facilities. We need somewhere to, to I mean, we don't, the United States is not geared up to, we don't have a, a massive uh, maritime economy like something like, like, Denmark or the, you know, <laughs> the Baltics and stuff like UK, that. UK, so, right. Yeah, we don't have the the shipbuilding capacity that is needed to build these things even. So the that needs to be ramped up. Uh, and that's just that's just ships. That's one component, right? And we're talking towers, jackets, nacelles, blades. Yeah, whatever. generators. Uh, right. Yeah. There's and, a lot to and be Rose, done. There, there's a lot to be done. And, and Rosemary, if you look at the, if you go to some of the OEMs and look at where their factories are, they have plenty of factories in China. Many factories in China. They have many factories in Europe. They have some factories in South America, not much. But America is like this factory desert wasteland. There's just nothing being built in the United States. There's there's some factories in Mexico. There's uh, the LM plant up in sort of northern Canada. But in the United States, there really isn't all that much. And are we? Is is this just a uniquely an American problem? Because it seems like everybody else is building wind turbines like crazy. Australia is not so you're not you're not totally alone um, but I mean to have a to build a new factory or even to maintain an existing factory you need a sales pipeline and you need some certainty and I, I think that I mean Australia and the US have in common that we haven't had consistent um, federal level policies that support the the industry so people don't know that if they build a a new factory that they're going to, you know, have sales for the next 10 years to support that. So 
I think that that's, that's one of the problems. Um, I think also the onshore aspect of the US, something that occurred to me while you were talking about where the wind resources are, <clears throat> excuse me, within the United States, they're all close together. Um, you know, all these states, I assume they're seeing the same wind, you know, when there's <laughs> wind blowing in Texas, it's probably also blowing in, in Arkansas or, you know, wherever, any of right. those other in windy places. And there's a certain point that you can get to with really correlated wind. I mean, it's like with, you know, solar, but it's all in the same um, location, turns on and off at the same time. If all your wind turns on and off at the same time, that's not nearly as valuable as if you have several different wind systems happening and they all are variable, but you know, their peaks and troughs don't line up exactly. So like in Australia, um, all of the, the South stuff, like South Australia, Victoria, um, Tasmania, where we have a lot of wind now, it's pretty correlated, but we're adding more in Queensland, which is not correlated and makes this immense difference to the, um, you know, security of the, of the system or, you know, the, the penetration of wind that you can get before you start um, having big problems. You know, if you've got 70% of your electricity from wind and it all comes on and off together, then you're going to see like a, a not very windy week is going to be a huge problem for you. Whereas right. if it's like 20% of your wind comes from one place and 20% from another place, it'll be really infrequent that those will, will line up. So I think that's why you're seeing so much attention on the offshore in the US because it won't be correlated with all that, you know, middle of America onshore stuff. It'll probably be a better resource. It's closer to the, you know, where you need to use the electricity and it's un uncorrelated would be my, my guess. I don't actually know. It's just my, my expectation. Um, so it makes sense to me that you would be more focused on on that and the oh, you know sure. the onshore wind turbines are s smaller as well so you can bring them in on on ships if you want i mean we, that's all we do in australia is bring it bring everything in practically on um ships so yeah uh, i think that yeah if you, if you want the factories it's a little harder and for them to be there well it's a little harder and that's why lm and uh well siemens and even vestas had factories or do have factories in the united in the central united states because that's where the action is but that action is dropping off dramatically. And I, I'm a little shocked by all this. Now that you see the numbers and the predictions, it's not the direction I think the United States wants to go in, but that's the direction we're headed in. It's it's based on moonlighting PTC. Yeah. If if you look at PTC that, funds, they've been they've been around since what, nineteen a long time. Ninety four. Long time. And yeah. they were they were, hey, we're gonna moonlight them. Oh, they're back. Hey, we're gonna moonlight them. Oh, they're back. Hey, we're going to moonlight them up their back. And now it's, hey, they're going away. And the Build Back Better Bill stuff and the, those things that are out right now, uh, there was a, there's a couple of uh, references to, hey, we're going to stick some money back into some some things to get the supply chain going and some other stuff. I don't know where they're at right now. Um, but PTC is done December 31st, and there's not a bill sitting out there right now to, to replenish it. I, I, that's right. It seems like if the – Congress, in the way it's formed right now, wanted to pass up, and they could, but it, it seems like we're getting these either massive bills or nothing. It's one yeah. or the other. Your, and your mark, your mark, your mark. All, yeah. Right, exactly. And if it's not done in the next couple of weeks, I think it's going to be trouble because there's. Uh, it seems like all the Congress is off running around trying to get yeah. reelected, and there will be very little action between now and November. Not to say it couldn't get done, but it gets I a mean, little scary. Consulting side on the U.S., you you hear a lot of that. Like, yeah, we might this project might go forward next year if PTC funds come back. Yeah, oh, we might do this right. if PTC funds come back. So we're just kind of sitting there twiddling our thumbs, waiting to see what happens. Lightning may be a force majeure, but lightning damage isn't. Actually, it's very predictable and very preventable. Strike Tape is a lightning protection system upgrade for wind turbines made by WeatherGuard. It dramatically improves the effectiveness of the factory LPS so you can stop worrying about lightning damage to your blades. Visit WeatherGuardWind.com to learn more, read a case study, and schedule a call. WeatherGuard is proud to be engineer-owned and operated in the USA. 
So in consideration of what's happening in the United States in terms of auctions, let's take a look at Japan because Japan's been going through, through some offshore auctions and it's led to a little bit of turmoil. So they had some auctions at the end of last year for provinces sort of up in the north and to the west on the coastline, which is a great wind resource for Japan. Uh, but they had problems in the auction is that the only people to really submit bids were Mitsubishi. And I know there's a lot of outside Japanese companies that are interested in, in being in Japan because the wind is pretty good there. And so they can make some a pretty good business. Uh, and then they try to have another, it sounds like they try to have another auction in March and the same sort of thing happened to the point where they just said, stop. <laughs> okay. We're going we're gonna to have to figure this out because they're getting criticized. It seems like everything was going one direction. Now I, I do not, blame Japan for trying to protect its own internal wind uh, OEMs. That makes complete sense to me. And we don't do it in the States, but other countries do. And, and Turkey's doing this too, by the way, right now. Turkey's developing their own wind turbine company inside of Turkey from the defense sector. That would be unfathomable in the United States at the moment. So Japan is going to reconfigure the way they do auctions. And they're going to try to open up to more players, and they're not going to allow one company to dominate all, buy all the sites at one time. So they're going to have to break it up a little bit. But one of the interesting pieces is, is they're considering how fast the wind farm is going to be developed. So you get credit, the, the faster you can put the wind energy online, you get bonus points for doing that. And that's something we haven't done in the States. And I don't even know if Australia is doing this, but it seems sort of intuitive. We can't sell the lease, wait five years, and then they kind of slowly develop it. Don't we need, Rosemary, more of the action to happen now rather than later? Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned Australia, but Australia, the um, development companies are way, way, way ahead of the, the government. They're like, you know, pulling the government along with them. Oh, you know, we, we'll need to submit <laughs> environmental approvals. Um, so you're going to need to develop a process for us. We're going to need to, you know, do this. So you'll need to develop this. Yeah. So it's kind of... Um, yeah, maybe it's back to front, but that's how the whole energy transition is happening in Australia, um, at least up until now. We've had a change of government, so it, it might change. Um, mm. Yeah, so <laughs> so slightly different. But I think, I mean, with Japan, it's not just interesting because they've got a, a good offshore resource. It's because they have so few other options. You know, they um, don't have a lot of space, right. solar panels, Um they don't want to use a lot of geothermal because uh, they don't want to, you know, put them in their beautiful national parks. Um, and True. yeah, they just, in general, they have a lot of trouble. They're, they're really talking about bringing in a lot of green hydrogen from Australia at, a, you know, a huge, or in other places, Saudi Arabia and, um, and Europe as well, I think. Um, hugely expensive. So the, the one thing that they've really got is offshore. It's got to be floating offshore for Japan, I'm pretty sure exclusively. The the few that they right. have are some of the first um, floating offshore wind turbines that are, have been installed. So they've got this really hard energy transition problem. They, they do seem pretty committed to it and have been over, you know, a period. So they've got to squeeze everything they can out of their, their offshore wind resource. Um, so it is important that they get it right and I do think there's a difference between awarding a contract to the person who says they can build it fastest compared to the person that, that does and does it well. Um, so, yeah, I think rewarding speed is good, but on its own, it could be really bad. You know, <laughs> if you end up um, causing delays for the whole industry because they cause problems or if you clog up these, prist um, these premium sites with dodgy projects that, you know, experience long delays because they have, you know, just um, insurmountable problems, then that will be bad. So, mm. um, yeah, I'm not sure your first auction is the place to um, try to get it, <laughs> get it happening really fast, but overall it's going to be important. But aren't there engineering ways to deal with some of the speed issues? You, know, you, you hear people say you can want it fast, you can want it cheap, or you can want it with quality, and you can pick two out of the three, right? Then, ha ha. Yeah, but, but it's also you know we we, we build a lot of things very quickly, and then we've done them very well. Like the space program was done in a couple of years. Yes, we had a f fire. Okay, sure, uh, but we we still we still got there, right? And but unless you put your foot down and say we are going to accelerate this. You're gonna, it's gonna get drug out. 
Yeah, that's so a, maybe an auction then isn't the right way to achieve that, where because that auction is really all about price, right? Getting the lowest price. Um, so maybe that's not the right thing to do. If you, I think space is a good analogy because you know building a lot of floating offshore wind is it, it is a brand new thing. It's a new frontier. Sure. So can you go after speed and price and quality all at the same time, a hundred percent? I don't think so. Um, no. Actually, you can you can say that's what you want to do and it sounds great can you achieve it there's, i'm not sure i think you have to prioritize there's some yeah there's some setups that i've seen that can 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 facilitate something like that um i did extensively worked in the state of illinois when i was a young engineer and what they would do on their their state contracts is they would say okay we have a design engineering firm so the design engineering firm would design the project this roads bridges highways whatever and they would design the project. Then they would say, okay, we're going to consult a construction company. Then the construction company would come in and, uh, or they would do a bid. Construction company would come in. Then they would hire a third engineering company or a second engineering company that would QC back the plans and the construction. And they were basically the QC for the state to make sure that the state, that the project went well for them so that right. they were trying to ensure. And a lot of those were competitive bids based on timeline. If you can get, if you can get this highway down before December 31st, then you get a X amount bonus, right? So to, but to control for QA, QC of the product, but then also, of course, you know, safety, you're looking at LTIs and these things, you start pushing people too fast. You have some of those problems. So they're looking for cost overruns, quality of the product, uh, safety of the, of course, the workers. Um, but it was putting controls in place. And of course, it's a different story in Illinois that, you know, government wants to have their hands in everything right so. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit different it's, yeah. it's it's doable but it's just an idea well yeah i, I think in the, I, we can try different things in different places right there's different approaches in different countries and there's different approaches in different states in the united states in particular everybody has their own take on things i do think it's a way we can get to some of these projects done sooner the question is do we have the will to do it are we going to have to you know, have some wind turbines that maybe fall over and hit the water and like, you know what? 99 out of the 100 are still up and running. We're okay. Let's keep going. That yeah, kind of thing. You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about uh, the offshore lease that's going to happen in California, right? So this is a far cry from that one, isn't it? When that one said, you're going to get bonus points if you engage within the community and build jobs locally and get in on board with the stakeholders. Whereas in Japan, right. they're saying, the faster you can install this thing, don't worry about that stuff. Let's go right. forward. Let's go. Right. Yeah. Well, I'd just like to see some of that happen in the United States. I think it's time. We're going to run out of yeah. time. 2030 is coming pretty fast, yeah. and we just don't have the infrastructure to do this. So we'll see what happens. That's going to do it for this week's Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe in the show notes below to the Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter, as well as Rosemary's famous YouTube channel. So we'll see you here next week on the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast.